What's up guys, Dr. Webb here. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon here in San Antonio, Texas. And in this video, I will be going over how to read a cervical MRI. We read a lot of these as spine surgeons and patients who present to my office with neck pain, with arm pain, with weakness, with gait abnormalities, it's usually coming from their cervical spine. So this is a quick and um, dirty tutorial. This does not replace any medical advice that you may receive from your provider and I'm not an expert on this I just read a lot of them it's gonna give my thoughts and some tips for you guys in terms of reading these and I will try to break it down in really layman's terms so that the layperson can understand a patient who may be wondering like hey what is this MRI report what does that mean well we're gonna break it down for you let's go so typically when I'm looking at MRI images, I'm looking at this view here. This is called the sagittal view. This is looking at it from the side. When you're looking directly, you're not in the front of the patient, not in the back of the patient. You're looking at it from the side. It's called the sagittal view. And this is called the axial view here. So I usually will have both of these up right next to each other. So as I'm scrolling through these images here, you can see that um, you know it changes. And depending on what level that I'm looking at, um, I can determine where a patient has pressure or stenosis, which is tightening of the spinal cord. Uh, a little bit of anatomy, I'll just point some things out for you guys. This is the base of the brain right here. I'm gonna scroll back more to the midline and you will see the spinal cord. So the spinal cord starts at the base of the brain and is this dark structure that is right here. This is the front of the spine. This is the back of the spine. These are the, vert the vertebral bodies, so C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7 and then we start getting into the thoracic spine. The top two vertebrae are different from the rest of the vertebrae. You have seven cervical verte vertebrae. The first two, they function for rotation of your neck. So the anterior portion of that ring is right here. And this is C2. This is the uh, odontoid uh, process or the, this the C2 body right here. And this is the back of the, the cervical spine. And then each of these levels here, this is what you can feel on the back of your your neck is the spinous process so all these levels here so when we are evaluating patients who have spinal complaints or who have been in an accident or maybe fall we look for deviations from that normal anatomy between each of your bones you have your disc or your cushion and it's these black objects right here they're normally supposed to be white the disc or the shock absorbers or the the the, the cushions between the bones when you lose that as we age because of loss of water content and essentially dries out, that's called desiccation. So all of this black right here is abnormal. We want to see white or healthy discs. These are very degenerated discs here. And you can see right away that there is a lot of protrusion or some stenosis here, tightening. So you see the spinal cord that is right in the middle. And as you go down, it looks like a clogged pipe. So this patient most likely has pretty severe neck pain. When the spinal cord is this tight right here, then we have to be concerned about gait abnormalities, dropping things out of your hands, more clumsy. Uh, you can have shooting pain down your arm called radiculopathy. All those are signs of spinal cord compromise or pressure on the spinal cord. But usually what I do we're gonna start off at C2 right here. This is C2, C3, and this is the corresponding level. This is the front of the spine, this is the back. This is the finest process that we just pointed out on the sagittal view. Uh, and your spinal cord is this dark structure here. It's normal to have spinal fluid around it, that white fluid on this sequence here. This is a T2 weighted images, there's T1 weighted images, there's stir sequences, but my kind of go-to, I'm looking at the axial T2 and also the sagittal. And this is the intervertebral disc right here. So this is what can press out or push out or spit out and press on the spinal cord or nerves. So if a patient has some of this disc right here that pushes out and pushes on the C6 nerve roots. Well, I know that patient may have trouble with uh, wrist 
flexion and also uh, some of their biceps function because that muscle is innervated by the C6 nerve roots. So if a patient has left arm weakness, I'm looking on their MRI, this is the left side over here, this is the right, because the patient's laying in the MRI scanner. So if a patient has stenosis at their C5, C6 level on the right side, you know, I'm looking for certain, certain deficits on exam to correspond with that. But starting at C2, C3, you see that the disc is degenerated. There's a little bit of pressure on the spinal cord, uh, kind of ventral or the front here. And at each level, there should be a hole right here. It should be nice and open for the nerve to leave this spinal cord at every single level. You have two of them, and they go out to innervate their respective muscle units or myotones. So at C2, C3, and then these are the facet joints right here. It has a little bit of fluid in it. The vertebral artery will be right here on both sides as we go down. And then you have your lamina. So it's kind of like the, the shingles on the roof. At every single level, there is the lamina uh, starting at C2 and down. And this kind of encases or protects the, the, the spinal cord and neural elements. And when we're talking about doing a decompression like a laminectomy, we're removing this bone right here to allow more space for the spinal cord. So this is at C2, C3. The spinal cord is for the most part nice and open. The nerve roots have uh, you know, a little bit of pressure on them, but I'm not too concerned about this level. As we go down to C3, 4 you see that the volume or the area for the spinal cord gets smaller. And that's because there's a large uh, piece of disc that is pushing on the spinal cord. And right back here between each of these uh, bones right here is the ligamentum. So you can have some ligamentum hypertrophy, which is enlarging or thickening of that, um, you know, that, that ligament that pushes on the spinal cord also, and that's another culprit for stenosis or tightening. So this patient has circumferential stenosis. They have pressure in the front and also pressure in the back, and their spinal cord is severely stenotic. And this is at C3, C4. When we go down to C4, C5, you'll see the spinal cord opens up once again. There's a little bit of pressure uh, in the uh, foramen here. That foramen should be a little bit larger on both sides. We go down to C5, C6, that foramen is tight on the left side, fairly tight, uh, moderately tight or mildly tight on the, um, the right side. And then at C6, C7, um, you see a little bit of pressure on both sides where the nerve roots, where those nerve roots exit the spinal cord. So this is a quick and dirty tutorial of how to read a cervical MRI in general. What we're looking for is the cervical vertebrae, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. Always have your sagittal and axial next to each other, and then have your T2 weighted images, and this is how we evaluate patients who have cervical complaints. This patient has severe stenosis of their cervical spine due to compression at C3, C4. They have multi-level disc degeneration disease when this disc turns black like this here. I don't see any abnormal lesions in the spinal cord, although this patient has some edema here. That whitening, or uh, that white area or increased intensity on this sequence here indicates that there is some damage to the spinal cord. That's called myelomalacia. When there's inflammation or edema in the spinal cord, and there are a couple different causes of that. As we roll through the Axial view here, we're, we're looking at the vertebral arteries at every level here. We're looking at the front of the spine. You also have your esophagus and your trachea that sits right in front of the spinal canal. You see it here. And generally, this is what we're looking for when we're evaluating patients who have cervical complaints. We can also look at the foramen. You can see it here, that little hole, and that's the hole that the, the nerve exits at every single level. The nerve root is that dark structure that is right there, and you should have fat around it or white around it, and then that's, that indicates that that nerve has uh, plenty of space. And we can scroll through the other side. This is the right side. I'm looking at that foramen. These are not the best sequences to look for that, but that foramen is right there. And then these are the facet joints, these levels right here. So the joint is a connection or a some type of connection between two structures, such as bones. And that facet joint can be a pain generator and can become arthritic and can become painful. 
And it, when we're addressing patients who have cervical stenosis, so this patient needs a decompression, which means we take the pressure off of the spinal cord, and you can achieve that in a number of different ways. Diller's choice, go anterior to the cervical spine here, ACDF, anterior cervical discectomy infusion. You can go posterior to decompress this patient, which means you enter back here, do a laminectomy and relieve the pressure, or you can do a combination of both. You can do a laminoplasty, which is essentially opening up a lamina on one side, and there are a couple different types of those, or, but those are the most common approaches for the cervical spine when someone presents with severe stenosis like this here. So this is a quick and dirty tutorial of how to read a cervical MRI. I hope this video was helpful. I have another video about how to read a lumbar MRI. And if you guys like this video, this format, please uh, put it in the comments below. Make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, and we'll see you next time.